Okay, if we could begin with a brief prayer. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy upon us and save us. I mean, glory to thee, O Lord, glory to thee, O Heavenly King, the Comfort, the Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present, fill us all things. O Trivia of every good, bestower of life, come and dwell in us and cleanse us from every stain and save our souls of good. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy upon us and save us. I mean, I agree, everyone. Hope, hope you're doing well. What is it, the first day of uh, the fall or autumn? So uh, before we know it, whether we like it or not, if we live past the day, we'll be getting snow. So we're going to try to be mindful of our time so we start properly and finish at a good time so you can get safely to your homes, especially in the wintertime. So for the last uh, few weeks when I've been giving the talk, I've been using this book uh, by now, St. Justin Popovich, Commentary on the Epistles of St. John the Theologian. So I'm going to continue uh, where we left off a few weeks ago, but before I do, I want to just give you some background because we're going to go to chapter, it's still chapter 1, verse 4, um, but if I don't give a, the, at least the first two or three verses prior, then this verse won't make too, uh, as much sense. So in, in chapter 1, verse 3, he says the following, well, St. John the theologian says the following, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have communion with us and truly our communion is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. So our, our struggle as Orthodox Christians is to, uh, St. Paul says, to grasp and, withhold, and hold and maintain the holy traditions of the faith. So in order for us to properly become real Christians, we need to uh, learn the Holy Fathers, who the fo Holy Fathers are, what their lives were like, what they taught, because, as he just said there, because then our union with them brings us into union communion with the living God, because Christ gave the authority to the apostles and to their successors to guide the church. So the verse we're going to talk about today, and we will even do a couple, uh, is chapter 1 again, verse 4. And these things we write unto you, that your joy may be full. Christ in another section in, in Scripture says that he didn't come just to give us life, but he gave us he gave us life and to have that life that's abundant life. So this links exactly with what St. John the Theologian is saying here in this verse, that your joy may be full. And St. Justin Popovich gives us uh, some commentary. Through life in the Holy Trinity, through communion with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Man's being is filled with true joy. Because the other types of joys in life, the, the sinful joys, I will say, do not really give us true joy. And I'll give you an example. If you get the, just get the back door. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, yeah it's okay. Here you go. That, uh, I remember a friend of mine, a long time ago, um, he had fallen to the temptation of uh, smoking marijuana. He was dealing with some difficulties. He was a good kid. It was probably the only bad thing he really did. And he goes, you know, Nico, what happened one time? He goes, I was high, and I heard a voice. Not a voice voice, but like a spiritual voice that said, if what you're experiencing right now is truly good, why does it leave? Meaning because, you know, you come down from that high. And many people who have problems with narcotics and addictions, they get worse and worse and worse because that first level wasn't good enough. They got to go higher and higher and higher. And then there's that crash. And he goes, after that happened, I never did it again because it's true. Now, my humble opinion is that God spoke to him because he saw his heart, saw that he, he was trying to find some therapy for his pains and went the wrong way. And God brought him back. And so, because the joy that we have in Christ is something that lasts, not just in this lifetime, forever, and I will add, and grows. It doesn't stop, right? And if we see that in our lives that we have these ebbs and flows, that's God showing us many things, two things in particular. One, that uh, we have some passions that we need to work on. And two, he's showing us that his grace are we to accomplish certain things because if God didn't allow at times for his grace to have some ebb and flow 
then we would fall into pride that, oh, now I'm accomplishing all these things. So we are always to give back the glory to God. Again, man's being is filled with true joy when it is communion with the Holy Spirit, which is nothing other than divine blessedness. Without this, man's being is filled with grief, sorrow, and woe. So we need to be asking ourselves at times when we have these experiences of grief, sorrow, and woe, we need to realign ourselves saying, why? Is what I'm going through right now going to affect my eternal salvation? And I'll give a silly example that we probably all have experienced. Losing our cell phone. And we freak out. Oh, no, I've lost everything. Right? From something so worldly, menial, material, we can actually lose eternity. So we always need to realign ourselves. We go through certain struggles. Is this going to affect my eternal salvation? And if not, I need not overly react about these things. I'm not saying who cares and be careless like that. But our measure, how we react to things, should be with that in mind. If not with that, then what can death, and even before death, sin... Fill the human being, a current of bitterness or sinful pleasures that gradually change into bitterness. And we see this, and God willing, during Great Holy Lent, which may seem a long time from now for Pascha, but it'll come quickly before we know it. In the parable of the prodigal son, when he was eating the, we say in Greek, I think in English it's translated as carobs or something like that, or husks. In Greek, the word xelokerata is a little bit better because and from the saints, the interpretation, I forget which saint explains this to us, but he says that the these husks or these carobs or these xilokerata, when you first eat them, they're fed, the, they're fed the pigs, right? When you first eat them, they taste sweet. But as you chew, the sweetness tends to, turns to bitterness. And that's exactly what the sinful pleasures are like. Like we said earlier, people who have problems with narcotics or any other type of hedonistic passion has that initial joy. Right? People, when they get drunk, they're drinking the alcohol, they feel good. They drink more and more and more. And then what happens after a period of time? They're puking in the toilet, right? As an example, right? The bitterness, these sinful pleasures that gradually change into bitterness pours forth into the soul through every sort of sin. In every case, through each sin is com through each sin committed, at least a drop of bitterness falls on the soul and imperceptibly spreads throughout the soul. So that's why we need to work on our passions, our weaknesses, our vices when we're young. As I say to my kids, you know, how easy is it to pull out a dandelion? It's not that difficult. How hard is it to pull out a small tree? How hard is it to pull out, you know, a 40-year-old tree? And that's how our passions are. So we need to work on them now, not tomorrow. The devil tells us, ah, tomorrow I'll do that. We need to work with discretion, with the guidance of our church, to work on the dominant passions and slowly pull them out. When the time comes, it grows into an enormous sorrow, and man very often does not even know where this grief in his soul and heart comes from because we're not trained properly when we're young spiritually to be watchful of these things. And also, something I'll mention, I'm not sure if St. Joseph Pope mentions it, but we also have inherited um, uh, dispositions to certain passions, right? Meaning, you know, we, we know from science, good science, that we have a genetic inheritance from our parents, right? We also spiritually inherit their dispositions, good and the not so good, right? Not that we use that as an excuse. Oh, my father's a drunk. That's why I'm a drunk but to know what we could be predisposed to and be watchful of that. Through communion with Christ and his holy virtues, man's being is filled with unceasing joy. And we at times should, and I hope, again, I'm being positively presumptuous tonight, ha should have experienced this at least once in our life in the most intimate way is when receiving Holy Communion. 
an unceasing joy, or participating in the sacrament of the mystery of confession, right? an unceasing joy. Through living the love of Christ, man's being is filled with inexpressible joy. St. Paul talks about that, right? This is Arita Ribata, unspeakable words. As well as from living the righteousness of Christ, the goodness of Christ, the humility and meekness of Christ. And when man looks into himself, behold, he is completely filled with divine joy. So hopefully one day we we say, not just with our words, but from our heart, what St. Paul said, the, some of the most beautiful uh, expressions that we have from St. Paul, Paul is called the mouth of Christ. It's not I who live, but Christ who lives within me. Like literally. Some of the early, I think even Russian monks would do this, where after they would partake of Holy Communion, they would look at their veins and they would show to each their brothers in Christ, say, we have the same blood, the blood of Christ in us. And that's what should be our joy. So when these temptations come of grief, sorrow, and whatnot, remember who you belong to. Remember whose blood you have within you. Remember whose baptism you wear. Remember who you commune with. And that will give us great joy. But the ways of the world, the fallen ways of the world, want to blot this from our mind. And only focus on the sinful things, the evil things, the bad things. We remember who we belong to. And when man looks into himself, behold, he is completely filled with divine joy. And there is not a trace of grief or fear of death in him. And you'll notice this, hopefully, when you read the lives of the saints, especially the martyrs. How could they martyr? It's because of this. They knew who their true love was. What does it say in the scriptures? You have forgotten about your first love. Our first love should be for Christ. And oftentimes, yeah, we love God, but he's not first. And so that's why certain temptations happen. God allows certain trials and temptations, even very difficult things to happen, to help us refocus where we should start. It's not that we shouldn't love our wife or our children or our neighbors or whatever it may be. It's natural, human to love. But the first we do is to focus on God because when we are in love with him properly, then we can properly love everyone else around us, including our enemies. Think about it. To love a neighbor, your brother, your sister, that's natural. To love your enemy? Come on. You cannot do it without God within you it's impossible that's to show you the surpassing love of god because he shows us in his example what does it say in the psalms if i'm not mistaken that he allows the rain and the sun to come out upon the evil and the just to show us how we should be therefore the holy theologian proclaims and these things we write unto you that your joy may be full Peplitomen is the Greek word. So when those temptations come, and they will come, remember the joy of Christ. Remember what he has, not just for us later on when we die, but from now. That should be our source of joy and encouragement. So that's all he was, uh, commented on, on, on verse 4. Before I go to verse 5, are there any questions or comments on what we just went through? And if you do, Fanny has the microphone, if you could kindly just take it for her and or you leave for the end, wherever you feel comfortable. So verse 5. This then is the message, in the Greek, Iagelia, which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And St. Joseph Popovich comments on this. This is an exceptional message on the part of the God-man. God is light. It means that he is the cause and source of everything that is of light. Truth, good, righteousness, and immortality. Think about it, light. And what does Christ say in the scriptures? 
those who work evil deeds, when do they do them? In at nighttime, in darkness, where they cannot be shown. Right? Because when there's light, everything is seen, and people do not want to perform their evil acts. But he is by no means a cause or co-cause, a source or co-source of evil, sin, death, and lies. Because again, and I encourage you to go back and read the book of Genesis. God created everything for us to enjoy. He did not create the fallen world that we have right now, the ways of the fallen world. So that's the deal that we need to remember when we go through certain difficulties. God has greater things for me than this world. Not that we should enjoy this world in the non-sinful way, because it is a blessing, the things we have in this world, but not our sole purpose in life. Sometimes we lose focus, right? Even when we're having good days, and I often actually have good days, we forget about God. You may have a great day where nothing might go wrong that day. It's a perfect day. It happens. God allows. But that's not the be-all to end-all. That God has even greater things for us. Christ spoke this message and through his life showed that God truly is light and in him is no darkness at all. Where is the darkness in the God-man? Where is the sin in him? Can anyone find sin in him or darkness in him? No one is able to find it. Darkness is from sin, and sin is from the devil, who is complete darkness. For the devil is the devil because he is, in every way possible, a genuine opposition to God. And from the Greek, the avalo, which means I turn upside down. The devil does. He turns things upside down. And I love how he says this, the last part there. A genuine opposition to God. The devil yeah. is not the opposite of God. Because that would make him a God. There is only one God. The devil opposes God. God is light. The devil is darkness. God is life. The devil is death. God is truth. The devil is deceit. That is why the Lord Christ, as the true God, was able to say about himself, I am the light of the world. So we should ask ourselves in our daily lives, are we light or are we darkness? Are we truthful or are we deceitful? And the devil, sorry, I am the light of the world and I am the light of life. And the devil could rightly say about himself, I am the darkness of the world. I am the darkness of life. And even look at our own lives when we sin. We're darkened. And the Father says certain times, our noose, again, it's hard to translate in English, but our mind's eye is darkened. And that's why it's very important, St. Paul tells everyone to do this, to say the Jesus prayer. He says, pray without ceasing. Because when we sin, oftentimes, if not every time, is because we're not praying. We're not being watchful. The thoughts come in. The evil one, he throws his darts. And because we're not watchful, we, do, we take those darts in and our noose gets darkened. So when those thoughts come, you flick them away by saying the Jesus prayer, right? Where we say in the in the Matins or Orthodox service, all the nations compass me round above, but by the name of the Lord, I ward them off. So important at all times, as much as possible, to say the Jesus prayer. It is only because of him that God does not see, sorry, it is, not, it is only because of him that man does not see the meaning of the world or the purpose and goal of life. Through his darkness, he blinds human eyes from seeing what the world and life are in reality. Light is necessary for the eyes to see, and only Christ, the God-man, has it and gives it. We see the light. Without light, our eyes are useless. That's what I was saying earlier about Great and Holy Lent for, for Pascha. 
when the priest comes out, you know, all the church, if you notice, is all in darkness. And then the priest comes out. And what does he say? Vef de lavet de force. Come receive the light that does never set, the unsetting light. We have a physical light that we see, but it's to show us the spiritual light of Christ. And if, especially this generation right now that's, that's, that's you know, being born and, and growing up, it's only if they have the light of Christ will they be able to walk in this very dark world. So that's why we should not fear. We should be teaching our children through our example primarily. Being a good example, being that light, and the children will follow that light. Not just the children, anyone around. Imagine if you're in a room and it's all dark and you're trying to find your way and somebody you know, flicks on a light or has a little candle. It's natural human reaction to go towards that light. That's what Christ says to us. You are the light of the world. Are we? And if we're not, or if not a bright enough light, then we need to work on that. Any questions on this part at all or comments? So verse 6, it continues. If we say that we have communion with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Scary, eh? This message, St. Popovich says, St. Justin Popovich, this message about God as light is proven through trial and experience. That's the spiritual life, eh? It's not theoretical. You know, reading the books, watching videos, all these things that we do are not the ends, but a means to what? So that we struggle to experience orthodox life christian life is experience right what did christ say to thomas put your hands here experience we have to experience god we have to experience the spiritual life it is proven through trial and personal experience of all true christians because they personally witnessed that living with christ and in christ is truly living with light and in light a good mood. I feel down. Whatever the expression that we use, which is the opposite of with light and in light. You know, a good experience. I hope that we've experienced at least once, if not many times, in holy confession. We should feel light. Right? There should be that burden that's been lifted upon off from us from holy confession. There is not one type of darkness that Christ cannot pull someone out of. Remember that. There's nothing that he can't put light into. Nothing. Even if it's at the 11th hour, even if it's somebody's deathbed. What is it? Well, again, St. John the Chrysostom, commenting on Christ during the Paschal address that he gives. He receives the last, even as he receives the first. Not that we should wait for the 11th hour, because we don't know when that 11th hour will be. But for our, our friends, our family, our friends, neighbors, enemies, people that we, you know, we have a relationship with, whether positive or negatively, that we should wish upon them, at least, Lord, in their 11th hour, that they may have that repentance, to always have that hope. The devil is the sower of hopelessness. If ever we experience or feel hopelessness, if not from you, 100%, and it's not from God. It's from the evil one. So those negative thoughts, those feelings of hopelessness, hopelessness, depression, whatever you want to call it, throw it away because it's not from God and it's not from you. You know, when Rene Descartes, you know, said, I think, therefore I am, nobody. <laughs> Don't always believe your thoughts. We are... To filter our thoughts. Where's that coming from? What's that experience on my soul? Is it helping me come towards God? Is it helping me repent for my sins? Give people they, their dreams. Oh, yeah, you had a dream. And someone wants to interpret their dream. Please. 
Whatever we do, we redeem for our salvation. Is it helping me repent? Is it helping me change my ways? Good. If not, throw it away. So again, there is not one type of darkness that Christ cannot pull someone out of. There is no sin that they cannot defeat through Christ. Through Christ. And I've seen it with my own eyes. Years ago, there was a person who, after the homily, came up and said, Nico, I'm a I was a homosexual. So I'm like, <laughs> a shock. What am I supposed to say? And they changed their whole life. How was that possible? Right? It was possible because that person wanted to conform their life to Christ, and Christ came to that person. What does he say? I knock. Everyone's door. Everyone's door. Even the worst of people that we judge as worse, God still knocks on their door. And we see this as an example for in the, in the United States, especially where you know former uh, doctors that would commit abortion, which is murder, and then realizing it afterwards, and now becoming anti-abortionists and proclaiming the evils. Right? Show. In their repentance just as the early light of dawn precedes the sun so the light of the world in life that is the light of the dawn of Christ's holy virtues proceeds before Christ when man starts to practice these virtues they begin to pour upon his soul the light of dawn which announces the birth of the Sun sun of righteousness which, when it is born in the soul, never sets, as we said earlier. Right? That paschal light never sets. Likewise, the darkness of sin precedes the darkness of its creator. If sins storm in the soul, they pour on it even thicker and thicker darkness. And thus man does not realize when he has been infiltrated by the creator of darkness and sin, the devil. And that's how we should look at other people. When people are doing certain things, whether to us or you're viewing or whatever it may be, just say, Lord, have mercy on that person's soul. Obviously, they have no idea. That's why Christ said, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Because there is something called, you know, the sins that we commit, and then there are passions. A passion, a vice, is a sin that we've committed over a period of time that operates within us, and we don't even realize it. it takes control of us. For example, I'll use a silly one, but smoking, right? All smokers know. They know what they're doing is wrong. But it's a passion, right? Or other types of passions. So another another example you can picture in your mind what, what these sins are like and upon a person's soul. Maybe I'm dating myself, but remember years ago, I'm not sure how long, I was probably 20 years, the Exxon Valdez, right? There's an oil tanker ruptured and all the oil went over and you saw the beautiful birds that were covered in this thick oil picture your soul spiritually metaphorically being as pure as a dove and then pouring all this molasses on top of it how's that bird going to fly the same thing with our soul the soul cannot fly towards god when it's covered with all this oil of sin whoever lives in sin lives in darkness and is unaware of where he goes every sin draws one into the kingdom of sin death and every dark thing draws one into the kingdom of darkness hell in the kingdom of death in the kingdom of darkness there is one king one master the devil the holy evangelist proclaims if we say that we have communion with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth. Very scary. And if it freaks you out, like it freaks me out, it's good. Because when St. John the Baptist, who we celebrate today, his conception said, repent. In the Greek, it's keep on repenting. Repentance is not a one-time thing. Repentance is every moment, the second that we sin, to realize it. To ask God for forgiveness at that moment. To write it down in a little book 
and bring it to confession, to be absolved by the servant of God. And then we fly to heaven. I'm going to go to verse 7 if there aren't any other questions or comments. So verse 7, he says the following. But if we walk in the light, and he is in the light, we have communion with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. What does the priest say when he's administering Holy Communion? Forgiveness of sins and of life everlasting. God, the Logos, the Logos is Christ. And as a quick side note, I think I said a few weeks ago, the Bible is not the Word of God. And all my Protestant friends are freaking out, saying, heresy, heresy. The Bible is words about the Word of God. Who is the Word of God? We know who the Word of God is. The Word of God is Christ, the Logos. So God the Logos, who is light, became man so that he could give men his divine light. That's what we see in the icons, the halo. And look how the halo has become in this world today. How demonic, eh? Taking God's light and not making it halo, demonic darkness. He made it accessible for them so that they would be able to possess it. In general, God, the Logos, through his incarnation, desires that everything of God be possessed by man and be incarnate in human life and in the world. That's what we see in the saints. Like we said earlier, what St. Paul said, he didn't just say it, he was living it. It's not I who live, but Christ who lives within me. That's why we have the relics of the saints, you know, that work miracles, that exude myrrh, incorrupt. Because what does it say? In thy saints shall be no corruption. The precept as, sorry, the precept is as he, as he is, that is how we must be. Again, those of you who know me well enough, I'm a part Spartan and it's going to come out right now. I'm working on it. We are Christians at times without Christ meaning Christians in name but not in our life I've said this many times and God willing I'll continue to say it St. John the Christum says give me five Christians and I'll conquer a city five so all the problems we see around the world Elder Paisios, St. Paisios when people would come to him they have certain problems he goes it's my fault he didn't even know the people. Eh? This couple comes, they're ready to get divorced. It's my fault. And they look at him. We don't, even, we don't even know you. What are you talking about? And what would he say? In sincerity, he said this. Well, if I were a saint of God, I would pray for you and God would help you. He blamed himself. Do we blame ourselves? Stay after you, money. Stay after you. After you. It's her fault. Big mouth. It doesn't shut up. Do we blame ourselves? So you have great virtue called aftomepsia, self-condemnation. And even if it's not 100% our fault, what's the expression? It takes two to tango. Eh? Do we shut our mouths? We do not, St. Porfirio says this, we do not defeat the devil with the devil. So if somebody's acting, let's say, an inappropriate way, what do we do? What's the expression? No. Do we fight fire with fire as a Christian? No. But in our life, how do we act? And that's why there are certain things happen in the world that things don't change, because we don't change. We don't blame ourselves. Everyone else is to blame except for me. I'm not to blame at all. All the problems, everybody else, me, nothing. So if that's true, then we should get an iconographer and start painting your icon in your life. Because obviously we have a walking saint in front of us. We need the change.
because on judgment day we're not going to we're not going to have to explain about everybody else's life our own all of us need to take this this medicine the spiritual medicine of aftobempsia self condemnation to blame ourselves even if we're one percent at fault we are a hundred percent responsible for that one percent oh but they started it what did you do well, i had more to it so you're worse than that person because you saw they started it and you added to it they didn't know but you knew so who's worse we are so we must become light as he is in the light so we must be as well also as he is in the truth so we must be everything that is his became ours through the incarnation we're going to say the adoption of sons we we be, we inherit we inherit the kingdom eternal life was brought down from heaven to earth by him and with it everything else that coexists with eternal life that is eternal truth eternal light eternal righteousness eternal love eternal goodness eternal wisdom and all other eternal divine perfections and that's why many times when people go to hold the eld holy elders or read the lives of the saints and we see certain things that they say we can't comprehend because our thinking is worldly thinking we don't think the way that Christians should think we are baptized we confess we receive Holy Communion all those things are excellent and very good but in our daily lives we don't energize those things we should call them things they're more than things we don't energize those blessings with our daily life he brought it from heaven to earth so that it could become ours in human. Eternal life becomes ours if we live in all the eternal theanthropic perfections. If we live in such a manner, the divine powers of those eternal perfections expel sin from all of us, cleanseth us from all filth. What does it say in the scriptures that those who love Christ have crucified themselves in the sinful passions? We call ourselves Christians, but we live certain lifestyles, carnal lifestyles. And then we wonder why we have problems. God does not bless sin. So why all the why questions that we have come back to us, what we're doing wrong. Because God is perfect. If we live in such a manner, the divine powers of those eternal perfections expel sin from all of us and cleanses us from all filth. It is understood that all these perfections constitute the essence of a theanthropic person. They are his, blo his blood. And his body and wherever his holy blood is the entire eternal life is so when we commune the body and blood of Christ it's not a peace it is him because in his the God man's blood is his life and through him from him and because of him ours also and that's where when you read the book of Revelation it says amongst many things of course those who have the blood of the lamb will be the ones that will be able to withstand and what is the blood of the lamb holy communion that's what we said earlier you know some monks and even pious Christians after they commune they look at their their veins and show with their brothers or blood brothers and that's why on a practical level especially with our children and ourselves as well that we need to be careful after we receive Holy Communion, that we don't cut ourselves because Christ's blood is literally, it's not symbolic, it's not just spiritual, it is. What did Christ say? Take, eat, this is my body, this is my blood. It didn't say symbolize, it said spiritual. 
It is, of course, spiritual, but not only. It is real, his body and his blood. The God-man is, is the one who distributes eternal life and his eternal perfection to man, and through them unites mankind into one new community. We spoke about this a few weeks ago. The Greek word kinonia, which means in certain cases holy communion, but it also means community. Can you have community without Christ? That's why the community, the society, is going where it's going, is Christ is not present. What did Christ say amongst many things upon the cross? Maybe actually before this crucifixion. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How many times that I want to bring you in, but you did not want to. And you hear today, and Christ says, you will hear about peace, 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 and you will see none. There can be no peace without Christ. It's impossible. Because he is peace. Jerusalem. What does it mean? What's Iero mean? Anyone? Iero. Holy. Salim. Peace. Holy peace. Christ is the only holy peace. And when we have it, no matter what they do to us, we never lose it. And if we lose it, that's because we were not being watchful. Can't take what we don't give them. So again, Christ is the one who distributes eternal life and his eternal perfection to man through them unites mankind into one new community, theanthropic, immortal, eternal, into one body, the church. Now my anti-ecumenical stuff is going to come out. That is why we have no relations with non-Orthodox Christians, with non-Christians. Not because we're better, not because of anything else, but because of this. They're not part of the body. That's why St. Joseph Popovich, I have a, an affection for him. Because he followed the Holy Fathers, it was was boldly, outwardly outspoken in the good sense of the word against false ecumenism, false unities. Of course, we want unity in love and in truth. Into the one body, the church, through which flows the blood of Christ the God man, which purifies every sin from every communicant, it's us who receive, and from every member of his theanthropic body. You know, when Christ says himself, certain sins that we commit, they're outside of the body. But other sins that we commit, the carnal sins, what does St. Paul say? Would you join Christ with a harlot? Surely not. But in our lives at times, we commit certain sins, and that's exactly what we do. Oh, but I'm married. St. Paul says the wedding bed is undefiled. And who gave you the right to interpret that, meaning that it's anything goes? Those who love Christ have crucified themselves in their sinful passions. The all pure blood washes us with light, washes us with truth, washes us with righteousness and with love. Then man's being shines with never before seen purity. I've seen that in people. Where you knew their past life, they looked dark, and then 20 years pass, you see them, and their life is wholly changed, and their face looks different. It's the same person, their face is full of light. The repentance. Therefore, the evangelist proclaims, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have communion with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I mean, I'm going to stop there. We've got some time to entertain some questions.
or comments? Anyone? Don't be shy. Funny, please. Uh, you mentioned passions and sins. I was just wondering, so what's what's happening? What's going wrong when we're doing our prayer rule? We're praying more, we're doing our spiritual readings, and we're still committing the same sin, and nothing seems to be changing. Uh, I like the last part, how you ended up. Nothing seems to be changing. Forgive me, those of you who know me well enough, uh, one of my weaknesses is hockey. And, you know, when a player has, you know, been playing a certain way, you know, or skating a certain way, the coach has to encourage him to change his ways. But it doesn't happen overnight, right? So we think, oh, nothing's changing. No, 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 no. That's from the evil one. That thought is purely from the evil one. It's God sees the struggle. When God sees that we struggle, he will add to it. When he sees it's fit, as we said earlier tonight, because if God were to do it all, boom, right away, we'd fall into pride. Because we're not prepared for that. It's like, for example, I, I hurt my back and I've been seeing some therapists. And they say, you know, so they do the therapy, say, but we have to do it some more because the body, when it's learned the wrong way, it wants to go back, <laughs> you know, where it was. So it's that persistence. And because, whether it's in ignorance or willful, we commit certain sins that become a bad habit. So it takes time. You gotta fight that, you know. If you ever stop smoking or ever stop drinking coffee or anything that so we we stop doing, the initial stage it's hell. We literally say it's hell. Right? I remember I, I quit drinking coffee, and the first week I thought my head was gonna explode. I'm talking about is what's going wrong? Oh no, that's normal. <laughs> Your body's detoxing from that drug, quote unquote. Right. So never give up the fight. God sees the struggle, and when He sees fit, He will reward you. We never give up. We fall, we get 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 up. To fall is human. To stay down is demonic. We rise, fight again, and fight again. You know, the teacher in the classroom sees the one child that's struggling hard. St. Paisio says, you know, the way that we mark people's papers, you know, A, B, C, D, whatever marks we give. Well, today you can't say that. You got to use other, you know, flowery terms. Progressing towards or whatever. He says it's different. Say somebody has a potential for six that's out of ten. That's all they can do. And they struggle really hard and they get six. God's marking, it's ten. And they were lazy, right? And they, they got a seven. It's actually a three because they had a higher potential and didn't struggle. So God wants to see us struggle Christ himself says that right labor for the food that does not perisheth right his holy body and his precious blood we struggle for that and uh, Saint Joseph the Hesychast soon to be canonized a saint one day his life is saintly and many saintly people around the world have mentioned it says we shall spit blood to receive the spirit in Greek, it rhymes. This doesn't mean literally. But it's a battle. It's a struggle, right? It's not a physical struggle with other people. It's an internal warfare, right? And Christ is our co-victor. We're not fighting by ourselves because that will lead to pride. So God, may for, for a long period of time, won't allow us to fully see our, our accomplishments when we're, when we're prepared, he remind us, that was me. So just keep struggling and never put down your sword, your spiritual sword, and God will crown you. And he's already crowning you. Sometimes he crowns us, we don't even see it. Because again, we fall into pride. So when we're prepared, he'll show us. Sorry for a very long-winded answer to your question. But I hope that helps. Anyone else with you? Kiriako, I can see the thoughts going all over. Feel free. If you can just use the microphone. You sure? Okay. 
you just pass the microphone back because uh, oh yeah 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 well the fallen world and I feel sorry for that person right because if that person doesn't repent before they die they're the accountability right like that's one thing we, we should be aware of when we commit a sin we're accountable to God for what we did but if we lead other people's people into sin right likewise when we work virtue and we do godly works if other people benefit from that we also get reward from that too right it's like a spiritual envelope you know we all have spiritual envelopes and those good works that we do for God's glory go into that envelope and if other people are encouraged by that I'll give I'll give an example I'm gonna say now because the gentleman's upstairs and won't hear me because I don't want to praise him but you know they sacrifice to have the space for us if we benefit spiritually which I hope you do they get some spiritual dividends I will call it <laughs> anyone with you it's a quiet group tonight I know I spoke a lot forgive me okay let's end with a brief prayer glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit both now and ever and unto the ages of ages I mean Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. O Christ, the true light, who dost enlighten and sanctify every man that cometh into the world. Let the light of thy countenance be signed upon us, that in it we may behold the unapproachable light. And guide our steps in the performance of thy commandments by the intercessions of thine all immaculate mother of all the saints. I mean, through the prayers of our holy fathers, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy upon us and save us. I mean, have a good night. Thank you for coming.